Greetings, this is Craig. What happens to the engine of a P-47 Thunderbolt when it takes hits from enemy fire? The Thunderbolt's engine, the Pratt & Whitney R-2800, was used in different versions in various planes like the F-4U Corsair, the F-6F Hellcat, and others. This engine has a legendary reputation for being able to take damage and still make it home. I've even read some examples made it back with several cylinders shot off, a claim I'll talk more about later in the video. The R2800 engine was rugged, no question about that, not only because it was a darn good engine, but also because it was air-cooled and not liquid-cooled. Air-cooled engines are generally less vulnerable to enemy fire because they don't have coolant radiators that can be easily shot out. Furthermore, the big R2800 has 18 cylinders, so a loss of one, assuming that's all you lost, isn't that big of a problem. For comparison, a four-cylinder engine in a car or light aircraft can lose 100% of its power from one cylinder, uh, from a hole in a piston or a burn valve, some similar problem, and in most cases, it will keep running well enough to get the car home or the airplane to a safe landing. However, it will have very little power when running on seven cylinders. The problem will be hugely obvious to the pilot or driver. And once that engine is shut off, it probably won't restart. A typical American V8, on the other hand, with eight cylinders, of course, will run so well on seven cylinders that some people won't even notice the problem and will operate the car that way for months. So with its 18 cylinders, in terms of its ability to keep running when damaged, the R2800 already has a big advantage over the typical V12s commonly used in fighter aircraft of the day, and some advantage over the 14-cylinder radials that were commonly in use at the time. And a lot of people use 14-cylinder radials, the United States, uh, Germany, Japan, uh, Soviet Union, and others. Of course, when talking about damage, you have to consider just what type of gun is shooting at the engine. There's a big difference between taking a hit from a 30 caliber machine gun, which is nominally a rifle caliber weapon, and a 37 millimeter automatic cannon. What's going to be worse, two rounds from a 20 millimeter cannon or 10 rounds from a 50 caliber machine gun? This type of question really matters to people in charge of arming warplanes, so it stands to reason that some effort was put into figuring this out. It turns out quite a bit of effort was put into this. During and just after the Second World War, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy teamed up to run what was called the Optimum Caliber Program. It sought to determine, among other things, what caliber of weapon would be best for air-to-air -air combat, both in regards to weapons mounted in fixed positions on fighter planes and guns on bombers which were typically mounted in movable turrets. They looked at everything, rate of fire, accuracy, damage delivered per unit of time or damage per round, really just about whatever metric you could want to look at in regards to shooting at airplanes, they did. I have a video coming out about this report soon, but the ultimate answer seemed to be a 20 millimeter shell for damage, but delivered with a rate of fire equal to that of 650 caliber World War II era machine guns, or at least rate of fire in that range. That's part of the reason you see so many U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy fighters after World War II with four 20 millimeter cannons. For example, the F-100 Super Sabre has four 20 mil cannons with a combined rate of fire of 6,000 rounds per minute. The 420 mils in an F.A. Crusader put out about 4,000 rounds per minute. These numbers compare pretty well with the 4,800 rounds per minute from the 650 cals in a typical World War II era Corsair or Mustang. Eventually, advances in firearms led to rotary barrel cannons with calibers in the 20 millimeter range that enables all of this to be done with a single cannon, which is what you see, for example, in the F-14 Tomcat. The specifics about the various weapons from the World War II era, 50 cal machine guns, 20 millimeter and 30 millimeter automatic cannons, are really another discussion. And I want to stay focused on just what happens to a P-47 engine, or an R-2800, when it's hit by enemy fire. And one of the various reports that were within the optimal caliber program 
has exactly that type of data. I need to stress that this is not a small test. Just counting P47 Thunderbolt R2800s alone, they shot up 157 of them to gather this data. 117 of them were shot at at 500 yards, 40 of them at 1,000 yards. The test also deals with different engines, both liquid and air-cooled, as well as early jet engines, and they shot up entire airplanes as well, and I'll get to most of that stuff in another video. For now, let's take a look at this chart, which is specific to R2800 damage. Unfortunately, the person who made this chart did not give us a legend for it on the chart itself or anywhere I could find in this 196-page document. The terms and definitions used are scattered throughout the pages, and some of those pages are not legible. Plus, some may be in other reports that were part of this series within the Optimal Caliber program, and I don't have every single one of the reports. In any case, I think we can use logic and basic math to figure this out. We're looking at engine component damage when fire is taken from the front below and to the side of the plane, just as you see in this drawing from the report. The angle of fire is coming in from about 20 degrees below the aircraft's longitudinal axis and about 20 degrees off to the side of that axis. The range was probably fixed at 500 yards. That's not specified, but that's the range most often used in the report. Unfortunately, the report doesn't say the duration of fire, which is a huge factor, but I think it was a 20 second burst. That's a time period used in other testing in this report and this series of reports, and the math for that seems to check out. Follow along with me here, and I'm relying on you firearms experts watching to check my math and logic and comment on this. There are about 70 hits by 50 caliber fire. Let's ignore the fact, for the moment, that in some cases an individual round hit more than one thing and just call it 70 rounds. The average rate of fire for a USM 250 cal machine gun in World War II was 13.3 rounds per second. Divide that into 70, I get 5.26 seconds as an absolute minimum duration with 100% accuracy to get about 70 rounds on target. Of course, we know it's not likely that 100% of those rounds hit the target. What percentage of rounds do you think is reasonable? I've never fired a fully automatic weapon, but I think one in four is reasonable for a machine gun with a fixed target this size at 500 yards. There are other tests in this report where they fired a 20 second burst. So I'm guessing that this test was using a 20 second burst of fire from the various guns and I think the math backs that up but I'm not really sure. I suppose ultimately it doesn't really matter though because regardless of the duration of the burst, what we're looking at here is damage per hit and of course the comparative data between the different guns within the given time period, whatever that is. So I suppose it doesn't matter much if it was a 10 or a 20 second burst or whatever. Let's look at the 50 caliber data first. Right away, I notice how many hits the propeller took, 16 hits to the prop. I have to say I was surprised about that. The prop took far more hits than any other single component. Now that I think about it, that makes sense. The combined area of the propeller blades is huge. Now to the right, of the number of hits column is a column labeled PH. This is not described anywhere I could find, but it appears to be the probability that any given hit will strike the component in question. Thus, in the case of the propeller, each hit had a 0.25 probability or a 25% chance of striking the prop. If you total up this column, the numbers uh, total up above 1, meaning above 100%. But I think that's because in some cases a round hit more than one thing. In other words, some went through the prop and hit something else, or hit a cylinder. Maybe a round went past the prop in some cases, hit a cylinder and ricocheted into another component, a magneto for example. In any case, the math here seems to check out for my theory, but you can work it out for yourself and see what you think. Now to the right of that, we have the percentages. So this one is in percentage, not in probability, which is kind of nice. The percentages of e, A or B kills. So we need to talk about what that means because it's important. Very early in the report, they talk about 
what it means to shoot down an airplane. In other words, how do you define shooting down an airplane? I've talked about this before in terms of pilot victory scores, which is complicated enough. But when looking at what really matters, which is the effect of the individual shoot down on the battle, or even in some cases, the direction of the war itself, it starts to add a lot of complexity to the discussion. And the people that were making this report frankly didn't care about pilot victory scores. They're looking at the much bigger picture. Now, as an example of the dilemma here, let's take a look at two Grumman F6F Hellcats, and let's say that they're attacking a pair of Val dive bombers. One Hellcat opens fire and the target aircraft explodes and falls into the ocean. The second Hellcat attacks the other bomber, killing the Val's gunner and mortally injuring the pilot, but he can still fly. That Val presses its attack and sinks an aircraft carrier before the pilot succumbs to his injuries and the plane crashes into the sea. Each Hellcat shot down one Val. In both cases, the Japanese lost a plane and the crew. However, one of those cases had a massively different effect on the battle. So for purposes of winning a war, not all air-to-air -air kills are the same, not even close. Thus, different categories of aircraft kills were created for these reports within the optimal caliber program. These categories are A through E. The first category is, of course, category A. This is for an aircraft that crashes within five minutes of being hit. Category A has two further subcategories, single K and double K, K as in kilo. A single K means that the plane crashes immediately after being hit. For example, if the pilot is killed, that's a category A subcategory K. Now, an A double K, means that the plane immediately crashes and its attack is totally defeated. For example, and this is the example they give in the report, a kamikaze aircraft that explodes and disintegrates would be an A double K kill. So even though a category A subcategory single K means that the plane crashes immediately, you could have a situation where that's not as meaningful as a double K. For example, if it's a kamikaze airplane and it's very close to its target and on course, it still presents some threat if it's a, a single K or an A double K doesn't. I hope that's clear and I know that some of this stuff is pretty dry, but if you don't understand these categories, then the report's results don't make any sense. Next up, we have category B kills. This is where the plane, after being hit, fails to return to base, the base in this case being two hours away. This covers a lot of situations. Hits that cause fuel leaks, oil leaks, coolant leaks, or maybe flight control damage that makes it impossible to land the airplane, but it can still fly to friendly territory where the crew will bail out. It causes the loss of the airplane, but doesn't necessarily mean the loss of the crew. And it's possible that a plane suffering B damage could still be a threat and perform a successful attack. It just doesn't make it back to base. The report we're dealing with today only looks at A and B damage. However, for the sake of completeness, I'll explain C, D, and E because those are parts of the other reports in the optimal caliber program. C damage, C as in Charlie, is a bit weird. It means that the plane could not perform a successful attack, but otherwise might be just fine. For example, damage that prevents a bomber from dropping its bombs due to jam bomb bay doors or whatever would be C damage. It can't drop its weapons, but it can fly home just fine. Now D, D as in Delta, only pertains to aircraft that did make it back, and it pertains to the number of man hours needed to repair it it may not be able to fly out on another mission for some time. And that, of course, is very important to the people that are analyzing big picture stuff. Now, E, E is an echo damage, pertains to a plane that's landed at its base, but suffers serious damage upon landing due to battle damage. For example, a plane that makes it back to base, but when it lands, a wing breaks off on touchdown, that sort of thing. The plane is totaled, but it did make it back 
um, that'll be category E damage. Now these categories overlap, which adds a little bit of confusion. So category B is in Bravo damage includes that five minute post hit period used to category used to categorize A damage. Thus B damage will always have a greater probability than A damage, and the sum of the two will exceed 100%. It gets even more complex when we factor in C, D, and E. However, in this video, thankfully, we're only dealing with A and B. Back to our page describing hits on the R2800. We're looking at those 16 hits to the prop. All of those hits to the prop failed to generate either an A or a B kill. Those numbers are zeros all the way across, so the plane was always in a position to make it back to base. It might be shaking like crazy and performance will suffer, but the Thunderbolt gets to go home. The next most commonly hit object on the engine are the rocker boxes. I think that makes sense. There are 18 cylinders. It's a two valve per cylinder engine, thus 36 valves and 36 rockers to actuate those valves, and they all need to be covered. Thus, there are a lot of them and they are not tiny. There's oil in the rocker boxes. It's not under pressure in there, so damage to one won't cause oil to spray out rapidly, but it will cause a leak. The rate of leakage will depend on the extent of damage and just how many rocker boxes were hit. In this case, 10 rocker boxes were hit, or about 16% of the total number of hits. These resulted in zero A kills. It turns out that a Pratt & Whitney R2800 or R2600 will run, a, the R2600 would be a right engine like you would see in a Grumman Avenger. Anyhow, either one of these engines will run longer than five minutes with no oil in it. Thus, no amount of oil leakage will result in an A kill. Now it's possible for leaking oil to catch fire and a fire can cause an A-kill, but leakage alone won't do it. So no matter how many rocker boxes get hit, the oil leakage caused will result in no worse than a B-kill. Even the chances of a B-kill weren't too high. Even with 10 rocker boxes hit, that only gave an average of a 1% chance of a B-kill on a Thunderbolt. Note there are maximum and minimum assessments of the chances of getting a particular type of kill, but I'm just going with the averages. This may seem a bit strange, that even with a big oil leak, the plane's engine could chug along for two hours and still get back to base with almost no chance it would run out of oil. But there are some other things to consider here. Air-cooled radials burned a lot of oil just in normal operation. So they were built with the assumption that a lot of oil would be used on every flight. The early P-47 Thunderbolts had a 28-gallon oil tank. That's gallons, not quarts. The later Thunderbolts had an even larger 40-gallon oil tank. It was the 28-gallon tanks that were used in the testing here. Even the World War II U.S. Navy fighters, which had nowhere near the range of the Thunderbolt, had pretty big oil tanks. Hellcats usually had 19-gallon tanks, Corsairs typically 20 or 24, depending on the model. Notice that the plane took three hits to the oil coolers. Now the oil coolers are under pressure, not like the rocker boxes, and any hit there will result in oil spraying out rapidly until the oil tank is empty. It won't be an instant loss, but it will be rapid. Just how rapid depends on the size of the hole and just how many there are. In this case, the oil coolers took three hits from 50 caliber fire, and this is the only category of hits to the R2800 from 50 caliber rounds that resulted in even a chance of an A kill. Those three hits gave an average of a 5% chance of an A kill, and that relatively small chance was created by the risk of oil catching fire, not from the loss of oil itself. Now the leak, or in this case, leaks themselves, give a 75% chance of creating a B kill. It's just not likely that with three 50 caliber holes in the oil coolers that it's going to make it back to a base two hours away. In fact, I'm surprised there's even a 25% chance of making it, but I think that's because sometimes these hits to the oil coolers just graze them or hit something else first, like the prop, and then the bullet didn't have enough energy left to do real damage to the oil coolers. 
Remember, we know that there are three hits, but all hits are not equal, and sometimes the oil coolers could be hit, but take minimal damage. It's interesting that a hit to the prop governor results in a 100% chance of a B kill. The problem I'm having here, though, is I'm not sure which propeller the P-47 had in this test. Most of them had Curtis Electric props. I would think that a hit to that would jam it or stop it from working. But looking at the diagram a certain way, I can see how a hit to this would cause the prop to feather, so maybe that's what happened. Or it could have been a Hamilton Standard prop, which used oil pressure from the engine, and a hit there in the right spot could cause a total loss of oil. I'm not really sure what happened here, but either way, it was a 100% B kill on the airplane. Notice that most things that get hit only have a very small chance of producing even a B kill and no chance of an A kill. Things like cylinder barrels, push rod covers, cylinder heads only have about a 2% chance of a B kill and that's with multiple hits to those components. I think this is where the idea that the R2800s could make it back with cylinders shot away comes from. I think if the enemy fire managed to actually blow a cylinder off of the engine, let alone multiple cylinders, it's going to stop running pretty quickly and would likely be a B-kill as a minimum due to the oil loss alone. However, shot off and shot up are not the same thing. A lot of types of damage could render one cylinder partially or totally inoperative. These include hits to the ignition leads, push rods, spark plugs, and more. I think the stories about P-47s coming back with cylinders shot off are actually cases where the engines were shot up and three or four cylinders were hit and no longer working, but the engine still ran well enough to get home. Plus, the amount of force needed to blow a cylinder clean off the engine is really beyond what we can reasonably expect from a 50 caliber or even a 20 millimeter round. Neither one managed to do that in this test. Now, in this damage report, we have looked at the 50 caliber data so far, but the chart has information on 60 cal and 20 millimeter hits. You can really ignore the 60 caliber stuff. That gun didn't go anywhere, or maybe it was developed into a 20 millimeter. The reasons why are really the domain of a gun channel, so I'm just going to skip that whole topic because the 60 cal just isn't really relevant to aviation history. Now the 20 millimeter cannon scored fewer hits as compared with the 50 caliber machine gun, which I expected, and as expected, each hit did more damage. The average chance of scoring a B kill is higher with the 20 millimeter. However, notice it didn't score a single A kill. That doesn't mean that the 20 millimeter stands less of a chance of scoring an A kill. It just means that in this particular test, the 50 cals happened to hit the oil cooler and the 20 millimeter didn't. This does give weight to the idea that rate of fire is quite important. The more lead you throw out there, the better the chance, the chance there is that you will hit something critical like the oil cooler. A hit there with the 20 millimeter would have caused more damage, but a 50 caliber round, if it punches through the oil cooler, will score a B kill anyway. It's worth noting that most engine kills were the result of a single round hitting something critical like an oil cooler, not the result of multiple rounds hitting the same component, which of course would be hard to do. Some of the critical components were simply never hit because they're on the back side of the engine. These include the injection carburetor and various control linkages. The engine oil tank is also behind the engine, but at this angle, it was possible but unlikely it would take a hit. One 60 caliber round did hit it, but it didn't cause a B kill, most likely because it hit high enough on the reservoir that the leakage wasn't a serious problem. Notice that the 50 cals scored three hits on the magnetos. There are two of these. They generate spark for the ignition systems. Each cylinder has two spark plugs and one fires the forward plug on each cylinder and the other fires the aft plugs. So there is no way that losing one mag will cause the engine to fail. It will cause it to lose some power. The dual spark plug ignition does add horsepower. Recently, I heard someone on another YouTube channel claiming that dual spark plugs don't add power, and that statement is simply false within this context, meaning World War II airplanes and vehicles with this type of combustion chamber. 
This is the type of misinformation that comes out when someone who has never flown an airplane claims to be an expert on the subject. Anyone who has even made it to the runway during their first lesson in a plane will learn that when shutting off a magneto, power drops as a result of losing one spark plug per cylinder. Turn them both on and it goes up again. This is really aircraft engine 101 stuff. Dual plugs have been used in drag racing engines based on Chrysler Hemi designs just about forever. That's not for fuel economy or emissions, it's for power. Aircraft engines have similar combustion chambers and do gain power from that second plug. And of course reliability, which is the main advantage. My point as it relates to this video is that losing a magneto will cause a loss in power. Not enough to seriously handicap the plane though. It can still fight and make it home, but its performance will suffer a little bit. Now, in this case, the plane took three hits to the mags, and this only resulted in a 3% chance of a B kill. My guess here is that it took two hits to one mag, probably knocking it out totally, and a minor hit to the second, maybe from a ricochet, and it was only lightly damaged. One thing is certain, hitting both mags hard enough to destroy them will stop the engine, but that didn't happen in this test. The data here shows that it's actually really hard to stop a P-47 Thunderbolt, or really anything else powered by a similar design air-cooled radial, with hits to the engine. It can happen with either 50 caliber or 20 millimeter, but it's not super likely. The 20 millimeter has better odds from each individual round, but the 50 cal gets more rounds on target. If you total up the odds of a B kill, the 50 cal comes out slightly ahead here, entirely due to the fact that more rounds on target gives a better chance of hitting something critical. Now, don't dismiss the 20 millimeter just yet. You can bring an airplane down by hitting a lot of things other than the engine. Now, this is stuff I want to cover in more detail in the next video, but just as an example, let's look at this graph. This is the probability of a single round producing an A kill on a P-47 when fired from that same angle. Let me get you oriented on this chart so it makes sense. A single 20 millimeter M96 round has about a 7.5% chance of scoring an A kill here. That's per round. The 50 caliber has less than a 2% chance. Again, that's on a per round basis. But it shows how many more rounds of 50 cal you have to put on target to even the odds, and it's way more than is realistic. The 50 cal shoot a bit faster, but generally not three or four times faster when comparing weapons of similar design, intended purpose, and time periods. Now, what about the odds of getting an A kill from a hit to the engine specifically? It's not high on a per round basis. The E on this chart is for engine hits, and it's only about one quarter of 1% for the 20 millimeter, and it's off scale low for the 50 caliber. Keep in mind, this is a chart looking at the entire airplane, not looking at the engine alone specifically. Meaning that, well, for example, in the case of the M96 round, if one hits the plane from this angle, there is less than a 2% chance of it scoring an A kill from an engine hit. It's not that each hit to the engine from a 20 millimeter has a 2% chance of scoring an A kill. It's that each hit from a 20 millimeter on the airplane as a whole has about a 7% chance of scoring an A kill, and about 2% of that 7 is from the chances of an A kill from a hit to the engine. Notice there is an F, a P, and an S in the vertical columns as well. These are the other sources of potential A kills, fuel, pilot, and structure. Remember, this is a chart for an A kill, meaning the plane goes down within five minutes. A fuel kill could be a hit to the fuel system in such a way that it cuts off the engine, or it could start a fire. Either way, a 20 millimeter cannon shell is much more likely to do the job than a 50 caliber round. As a side note, the 60 cal looks really effective here, but again, as it's not something that really made it into production on an operational fighter, I'm ignoring it. It would probably be an interesting discussion for a gun channel. Let's take uh, a quick look at the results for the bigger guns. Again, we're getting away from the engine damage topic specifically, but I want you to see where we're going in the next video. 
This chart shows the probability of an A or B kill with the German 30mm and a US 37. Now, the question of which German 30mm is important, and you would think it would be clearly stated right there on the chart, but no. I think this is from an MK103, which has a projectile weight not too far from some of the 37 millimeters. Now it was the MK-108 which was the one commonly used on the Luftwaffe aircraft in World War II, which had a much lighter projectile than the MK-103 or a typical 37 millimeter. That MK-103 was only used on some very uh, unusual late war aircraft. I don't think any actually went into combat against US fighters. Anyway, you can see that on a per round basis, the German cannon was devastating. Each round had about a 28% chance of scoring an A kill here, and a 42% chance of scoring a B kill each round. This video is already getting longer than I had planned, so I'll get into damage from other angles against bombers per amount of time on target, and these other things in the next one. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and please consider joining my Patreon, where you will find this and other reports I use in the creation of these videos. I often have polls there to determine the direction of this channel, which is how we ended up with this video here today, as well as early release videos and sometimes even exclusive videos. So that's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.